we know that you're just really excited about the topic. We're just like, let's <laughs> let's jump, let's jump into it. Um, also, I'm Dalton Mulchar. I'm the founder of Calm Advantage. And so that we're a company that specializes in academic and personal success of first year business university students. Um, and I also work as a business coach, kind of helping entrepreneurs scale up their business. And I'm a, a mom of a two-year-old. So very interested in kind of that spectrum of digital literacy all the way from Right now, we're introducing it to our two-year-old um, up to those university students that I'm working with uh, through, through my business. So I am Dr. Lori Culverson. I'm the founder of STEM Excellence. We are a company in the States that works with primarily pre-med students. So we help them from high school graduation all the way up through medical school acceptance and really coach them through the entire process from doing well in their courses to all the extracurriculars that they need and all the exams that they have to take along the way. And just like Dalton said, digital literacy is very important for our kids too, especially with the changing landscape of the world. So very interested and excited to chat about this topic. Nice, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Elise Beckles, based out of Toronto, Canada, and my company is called The French Tutor, so you guessed it, we tutor French and we provide French support and French resources, mainly for students at the elementary age, which here in Canada, learning French is very important and quite a good asset, so we work on just providing the right support um, for elementary age students in French. Digital literacy for us is super important. We're kind of working with the generation that it's more and more prominent in their everyday. So we're also focused on incorporating that into how we teach them. Oh, wow. No, thank you, everyone. And again, apologies for, for skipping that. Um, I think everyone in my, in my group, they know that the Beerus and Mavis making uh, an entrance that in the evening is the time just to really relax. So it's fine. These webinars are you know, informative, but relaxed as well. So it just helps to put everyone else at ease as well. Um, but thank you everyone for you know, introducing yourselves. And it's amazing to hear how digital literacy um, really informs you know, what you're doing. Um, and so I think that really segues nicely into the first question, which is well, what does digital literacy mean for each of you? Because it's quite a big word, it's a big phrase, and it can mean so many different things, right? So what does it mean for you guys? Who would like to, to take that? I think the funny thing is, to me, it means almost everything. Like, what are we doing that isn't digital literacy at this point, um, right? Like, specifically for the students that I work with, we're looking at, you know, how do you curate the information that you're getting through online resources? How do you turn that into research? How do you make sure that you understand it? And then how do you actually use it for persuasion? Because so much of um, what we're doing now in academics is less of the traditional presentation of information and more in, um, you know, graphical, video, uh, very much the types of, you know, media that you're seeing when you are online or you are on your phone. So it, to me, it's almost what isn't digital literacy at, at this point. No, thank you, Dalton. I think you've hit on some great points there. Um, as you say, especially nowadays, everything is pretty much online, right? And it's not just about being able to obtain the information, but being able to decide and decipher what actually what is relevant and what is irrelevant. Um, did anyone else want to add anything else? Yeah, I mean, I can contribute to that. Sorry, Dr. Lori, I can contribute to that and share that, you know, when I spoke to me, our company working specifically with the generation that grew up, they're digital more so than me, right? They're more so two years old. They know how to operate the iPad. They're aware of YouTube kids, how to get to that app. So for us, it's about almost meeting them where they're already at. So I think as an instructor, our team, as you know, the founder of a company, we've had to more so adapt and include digital uh, literacy and everything that we do so that they can best understand it. Yeah, wow, well, you're absolutely spot on. I think you're right there. You know, kids as young as two, they know how to operate iPads. <laughs> they know what, you know, what apps to use. 
um, better than, than most adults, right? And so, yeah, it's about meeting them where they're at so that we can really just excel their, their learning. And Dr. Laurie, was there anything that you wanted to, to add as well? Yeah, I was just gonna add about the fact that there's so many resources now because of the, just the digital age, I guess you could say, that there's a wealth of resources about anything and everything that you want. And that can be really powerful, but it also can be really dangerous. So, because it's not always true what you have as a resource. So being able to decipher what it is that you can pay attention to and give credit to and what you can't give credit to. And then also, you know, being able to essentially learn anything that you want to learn and be able to put that together because this, uh, there's so many resources out there. It, it really is an important tool to be able to have. Yeah, I think that's, you know, an awesome point that you've made there. The, the internet is continuously evolving. It's like an organic organism, right? And nothing gets deleted. And so there's information that is outdated. And how do you know when, I guess, for most people, and I have to say that I probably fall into that category as well. When you look it up on Google, you just think, okay, right? This is, this is probably true, it's here. So it's being able to understand what, and know the skills to decipher what, what is useful, what is true. And as you say, for academia as well, well, can you even cite that? Can you even use that? So I guess that segues nicely into to the next question really, which is, you know, what are the dangers then of students missing out on digital literacy skills? because there's still a lot of parents who are a bit dubious about, uh, you know, yeah. online um, resources. I know for, you know, English tuition, for example, many parents are still like, oh no, reading online and using that, it's better to go to the library. And I guess for you guys, I'm sure you've experienced that too. So, you know, how, how would, what would you say are the, the, the disadvantages and the dangers of students missing out on digital literacy skills? We'd like to take that. I think Elise really hit it on the, the nail on the head there. That's the phrase I was looking for of <laughs> most of these kids are growing up in such a digital environment that it's irresponsible if we're not equipping them with the skills to navigate that environment. So whether it's just from a, you know, a personal security standpoint, right? You know, what should you be putting on the internet? What shouldn't you be putting on the internet? How do you engage with social media apps? That type of thing. We are in an era of misinformation, and we've certainly seen that in the last few years, you know, being able to decipher what's a trusted information source, it goes beyond academic research, and I can talk hours about the gaps in first-year university students' ability to research things and the problems that causes, but it also just comes down to us as decision makers and, you know, consumers in society. If you want to actually be an informed decision maker about whatever's going on in your life. You have to be able to decipher what information is good and what information isn't good. It applies to so much things beyond writing a paper and citing that paper. So I, I really think that if we're not actively cultivating those skills in kids and students, um, we're doing a disservice to them. Yeah, I mean, I think you've, you know, hit on a lot of key points there, um, Dalton. As you say, it's, you know, without, without being offensive, a bit irresponsible, because whether we like it or not, kids are using um, digital tools. And so it's better to prepare them. So one, for safety, so they can keep themselves safe and know well, actually what should they be putting on the internet and what they shouldn't be. But as you say as well, it's those critical skills, as you say, it's not just about, you know, being able to, to, to use it to write papers, but being able to research and use it because you have really at your fingertips a global library as such. So I think that's really um, important to understand. Um, is there anything else that anyone wanted to, to contribute to that question as well? Is there anything else anyone wanted to add? You know, on top of that, um, it's sort of the age that we're in with all of the digital um, aspects, it's not going away. It's not going to go backwards. We're only going to get more digital and we're only going to increase the amount of information and the amount of digital interaction that we have. And so if we look at kids now in 20 years being 
adults and going to get jobs and going to become responsible adults, if we don't cultivate those skills in them now, they're going to be at a gross disadvantage whenever they go and they try to enter the workforce or enter adult life. And it's it, it's going to really be even more than now, a skill that is essentially essential to be able to interact with the world. Yeah, I think that's really important. I, I think that you've mentioned there as well is that, that it's going to advance even more. And so if we're holding our kids back now, then we're actually setting them up for failure in the long term because it's not going to stop, right? It's just going to continue to evolve. Um, well, so many people think that we're talking about like how to use a certain app or how to, you know, post on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. And really, we're talking about fundamental critical thinking skills yeah. that they're going to carry throughout life. Like my students, right? We're, I'm I work with business students, so they're the. It's all about preparing them to enter that workforce. And when you were working at Uber and Google and Facebook and you know all of the other companies that my students go on to work with, it's because they have that critical competencies that kind of spreads across all of this. The world's only going to get more competitive as we automate more and more jobs. So if you don't have those critical analysis skills, it's going to be more and more challenging to actually seek out for like fulfilling employment. Yeah, absolutely. As you say, more more, um, employment opportunities are going to require those skills. And so if you don't cultivate them now and we set them up to be almost something to be feared, they're not going to be able to, to access it. They're not going to be competitive in any any sort of you know career choice that they want. Um, Elise, was there anything that you wanted to, to add as well? Yeah, I wasn't gonna expand on your thought, but you said the word that was screaming out at me during the conversation, that was access. So I tell parents all the time, you know, adopting a kind of an open mind, let's say, to digital literacy is giving your child access. And that is kind of what the bottom line is. We, you know, I know all of us respectively work in different areas of education, but we're also laser focused on ensuring that our students are successful in these areas. So why as a parent, would you not want your child to have the best or the fairest chance, opportunity, experience possible? And sometimes that's outside of where you live, but they shouldn't be you know, unable to get that, you know, appropriate training or expertise building because of the lack of open-mindedness to, oh, okay, digitally they can win. So let's just open our minds to, you know, let's give this digital thing a chance, right? So that's what I'll say to that access. Yeah, no, absolutely, Elise. I think you've really um, eloquently put, uh, you know, formulated that really well as you say it's about access and giving children the opportunity and not being afraid so that we are open-minded so that our children can and you know the world is opening up the amount of you know careers that are possible for you know you know kids nowadays compared to the past it's not like where you would just stay in one place for for many years you know stay you start a job and that was it it's a lot more portfolio based and i think you need to be able to to access the digital space to be able to one to use those skills to fulfill those jobs but also to sell yourself um as well online to to make sure that you are standing out from the the crowd so i think you're all um what you've said there was really fantastic um and i guess that leads on quite nicely then to well okay let's say parents have accepted that um you know the digital literacy is really crucial and essential for their child how can they go about helping their child to improve their digital literacy? Or how can a student, let's say a student is aware, because I don't know if it's the same in America and in Canada, I'm probably sure it is, please correct me if I'm wrong, but a recent study in the UK found that um, a lot of university students um, in the UK were complaining because they lacked the digital literacy skills. And so we're seeing that there's a problem that is persisting at university level, which means we have graduates who are digitally illiterate as such and there were lots of complaints about that so how can students and how can parents I guess help their child cultivate digital literacy skills I'm 
wants to take that one. I will say it is definitely the same in Canada for those university students who are coming in. And when we say like they don't have the digital, digital literacy skills, I'm talking about like finding appropriate research and understanding whether it is accurate or not accurate. Navigating different online portals. There's a portal for everything these days. And we seem to kind of have this bubble of a cohort right now that's like, mm, is that Excel? No, thank you. Mm, is that a Google Doc? No, thank you. Mm. And I don't know where it really came from. It doesn't, we seem to, it seems to be there. But um, I think that when we think about literacy in general, we're talking about, you know, listening, speaking, reading, and that critical thinking that goes into it. And I think that's the same when you put a digital lens on it as well, right? Um, things like, you know, reading and consuming content through an online, you know, whatever form, and then having discussions about that, um, you know, whether it's with your, like the parents facilitating those discussions, whether an educator's, you know, facilitating those discussions, it's really about motivating the, the child or, or teen that you're working with to engage those same critical thinking skills that they would be using in a you know non-digital literacy context I guess in the context of whatever they're doing in that digital situation I know for me one of the reasons that we use so many online tools um, for common advantage is because that's the expectation that students will know how to utilize them both for school and in the workplace and so we're doing that and it's integrated throughout our curriculum yes I might be teaching statistics or accounting or whatever else but woven in that is that ability to you know utilize those actual technical digital skills and then also engage that critical thinking of is do I need this is this accurate information or is this not accurate information um, so I think it's just about really wholeheartedly engaging with the content and having those open discussions about what's relevant what's not relevant the same as when you were you know reading your kid the you know old mcdonald on the farm and you're like mm, does the cow really stand on top of the you know farm like we have those discussions all the time we're just doing them in a in a digital setting kind of thing no, I think that's fantastic. As you say, just getting on board and engaging with it rather than shying away from it and being able to bring to light, um, as you say, those critical discussions, which are crucial, and just getting them um, used to navigating different portals and different systems, right? There's an app for everything, but there's also different portals as well, right? I mean, um, it's literally like a labyrinth and being able just to break it down for them so that they don't feel afraid or overwhelmed by the, the just the sheer amount of information. Um, I think that's really crucial for them. Does anyone else want to, to weigh in? Yeah, I think another thing that's really important to teach kids is that just because something's online doesn't mean it's true. And have it, asking exactly those questions like Dalton was saying, like, okay, well, you saw this online today. Do you think that's true? Do you think that's something we can trust? Who said it? We can't like teaching teaching students to go and look at who wrote the article and what their credentials are. And well, is this somebody that you think is credible? Is this something somebody that you think you can believe what they're saying? Or even do you think they're giving you their opinion or do you think they're giving you facts? Having those sort of discussions, even just asking, did you read anything online today? Did you see anything new online today? And then having a discussion about that, about, well, what do you think about it? And constantly asking, well, do you think that's something that's true? Or do you think that's something that you can believe? Well, at least introduce the idea that you can't believe everything that you see online because I think that's kind of where it does get dangerous sometimes is whenever kids think just because it's online well it's published somewhere so it must be true and it's really important to introduce that idea as often as possible that it doesn't have to be true. Yeah I think that's fantastic as you say giving them that healthy dose of you know, doubt really, so that they're not just taking it verbatim, they're not taking it word for word, but they're actually, you know, critically engaging it. And as you say, making them aware that just because it's online doesn't mean that it doesn't have bias. And as you say, just breaking it down and thinking, well, where is this source on the internet? Is this a credible site? Because I think that's another thing as well, as you say, not even just in 
um, you know, general life, um, but also in the academic world as well. I often get students, and I'm sure you you probably have many funny st stories of this, where they've cited something. I'm like, where where on earth did you uncover this? What is this? You know, and it's like the site you've got it from is well is that does that look like a, a credible url does that even look like a credible source what else has that person even written or, or done and then when you kind of highlight it you can see that the student or the child is a bit like oh yeah actually i didn't think of that so i think that's really important as you say to just really engage and, and discuss with them um elise is there anything else that you you wanted to, to weigh in or add yeah so i think even to your point all of you actually it's know what resources like what weight to give resources based on your particular use case so for us with language learning especially french our parents that we work with are not or more than likely usually not french speakers so google translate has been their best friend and you know i get it i do get it but we have to let them know guys google translate is not the expert on French grammar or, you know, even sometimes sentences don't always make sense. So just an example to support, yes, Google is awesome for, you know, starting your journey on certain research, and certain credibility um, access points, but at the same time, just know what resources and that takes, I guess, research and getting a second opinion to know what to use for what. I think that's really fantastic, Elise. I mean, I have to say I'm guilty of using Google Translate. And as you say, it's only when you go to the native speaker or an expert and you're like, oh, OK, this is not the best resource. OK, I need to start. Help. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that's that's um, yeah, a really relatable point. I think that most parents um, can relate to there. So yeah, no, fantastic. Just checking out, really. And as you say, getting that guidance and support as well. That's why there are experts. Um, that you can, um, you know, ask, um, which is why we've created what we've created, right? Um, and I guess then that really leads nicely on then to um, how do you feel then? Um, obviously, we know about the digital age, how it, well, we're living through it and how there's been changes. But what do you think has been the biggest change, I guess, in the last, let's say, five years to keep it kind of short in all of your respective, you know, industries? Um, because I know that is quite a vast, a vast question to ask. So just if you can choose like one area. So uh, let me give you an example for, for us. But if we're talking about English studies, which is what we specialize in, I guess one of the biggest um, access points is um, the ability to um, annotate and have like multi um, like media in, in, in text. So even text like Shakespeare, we can now um, annotate and use different resources and input from critics that we just didn't have before. And that's really brought it to life in a, in a new light. And that's been really powerful for students. Is there anything that you feel um, that has changed? So I think for us, we incorporate, like growing up, we never had any gamification. School was, learning was very templated and extremely, either you get it or you don't. Like there was not a, oh, let me tweak for, you know, a different learning ability or even consider a different approach to see if this sticks better or this is a little more impactful. So I think one of the major changes I think I've seen is the ability to pivot to suit students to give them the best possible experience and also approaching teaching from a view of not everyone's going to learn the same. So how are you distinguishing yourself that you know, every student is welcome and there's gonna be something for them. I think it's just a new perspective or view uh, when it comes to education. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. How you say like gamification, so you can make it more kind of an enjoyable experience for yes. students, right? And as you say, for educators, it allows us to differentiate better. So that way then we're not just, I don't know if it's the same in um, the UK, uh, the US and um, in Canada, but for example, we, we tend to have like tiers. So we have a bottom set and a higher set and the kids know, and it doesn't make them feel great about it. Whereas having online platforms, it allows us to have children, you know, maybe of different abilities in the same class in the same space online so that they can learn from one another and they still get what they need. So we can actually tailor it for that individual. I think that's a really great point. 
um, Elise. Anything else that anyone wants to weigh in there as well? I think a really big shift, especially over the last five years, has been exams. For the majority of all standardized exams, they're online now. And then whenever you go down into the university level, the majority of university exams, at least for the universities we work with, are also online now. And that generally includes navigating different platforms. It's not just a matter of being able to answer the questions, it's also being able to utilize all the tools that are on that platform where you're taking the exam. And sometimes you have to be able to draw molecules with this really awkward drawer where you're having to paste in little different parts of a molecule. And if it takes you 45 minutes to figure out how to draw a molecule, then you've got 50 minutes to take the exam and it's gonna be a little bit tough for you. So part using all of the different parts of online learning and then being tested on them has been a big shift at the university level over the last few years yeah that's an incredible shift as you say because it impacts how they take the test right so if they can't if they don't have that fundamental skill then as you say it really strips them back for their time so yeah wow that's incredible i did not know that so that's a really enlightened for me um, Dalton, is there anything that you wanted to to add? TikTok, man. It's all about <laughs> TikTok um, in actually a good way. So most of the time when I'm talking with other educators, they'll talk about how TikTok has shortened students' attention spans. I actually think students have always had short attention spans. Um, and just as educators, we've steamrolled them on that. And they've never learned anything in the last half of their class anyways. But TikTok has become a platform, again, lots of misinformation, but lots of good information. And inherently so many videos being shared that are sharing news resources, but also like really breaking them down, talking about, you know, how do you make this type of cookie? How do you, what's the best salad? Like really showing people how to do things. And I'm finding that students are really actually embracing a learning mindset because of how they engage on TikTok. Um, where they're like, oh, I can learn that. I just haven't learned it yet. And I think that's one of the most powerful things a student can do is embrace like, okay, I haven't figured this out yet. Not that they can't do it. And so this does two things for me. One, it shows me that if I make statistics fun enough engaging enough they're ready to consume that content and I look at the courses that I'm creating literally as content for these kids to consume and on the other side of it because there is so much information it means that I really do have to equip my students with the ability to navigate that information um, five years ago I had a really hard time teaching students statistics and like why it would be relevant and that one day they're gonna read a research paper and want to know if the sample size is good enough to know whether that's a credible paper or not these kids have lists of citations that they're actually getting off of TikTok and they're like well was Joe right when he made this claim on TikTok like they want to know they want to be able to make their rebuttal their <laughs> stitch their whatever and I've never had a time when like they've been more excited to learn how to break down that paper and I'm seeing it on my students TikToks where they're like literally going back and forth with major people breaking down academic research in a way that we would have never seen before. So we can often think like, oh yeah, TikTok is a big bad thing that's out there, but really it is motivating my students to engage. And I just have to, I, you know, Lisa said this several times, like we have to meet them where they're at. So like part of my curriculum is go find a TikTok that you've watched where they're citing something let's break down whether that citation was good or not. It's statistics, it's digital, digital literacy, it's engaging them on the topics that they're interested in. Um, and I actually think it's one of the coolest evolutions I've seen um, out there. Cause like they really are engaging and they care. Now, granted, I have to teach things in three minute intervals or less a lot <laughs> of the time. That's a skill that I'm evolving with. Um, but I think, I think that the, that they are information hungry 
in a way that my students five, 10 years ago weren't. Um, and that's a really good thing as long as we can equip them with those critical analysis skills to navigate it and not be steamrolled by it. What I tell my um, students all the time is like, you can either be simply a consumer or you can be a real decision maker. And it really has to do with how you can kind of put that critical lens on the information that you're, you know, being pitched there. So I'm pro TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Dawn. I think that's, you know, a fantastic point, as you say, because a lot of the time, um, I think platforms like TikTok, you know, YouTube and other, you know, other platforms, they get a lot of stick because as you say, we feel that it, um, you know, limits and um, actually damages children's concentration. But as you say, actually it makes them more engaged and hungry for information. Um, a lot of my students, they love being able to put together videos for YouTube to share their ideas on a text that they've explored because they want to see what others think and whether they engage. And it allows them to really collaborate, which I think is really important, which the digital space has opened up. And as you say, as long as they are, and I really like that, they're not just consuming the information, but being active decision makers, that's a really powerful tool, um, both for instructors and for the students themselves as well. So I think that's a really fantastic point to highlight, actually, rather than being afraid of it, just embracing it and looking for actually what is really going on here, reading in between the lines and seeing actually what are they coming back with. So I think that's fantastic. Um, and we're just about to wrap up here. Is there any other comments? I know that we can talk I know I could, and I'm sure you guys could all as well, talk for hours and hours upon this, but is there anything else that you wanted to say on this topic? Is there anything else that you feel is vital? I think that this is really important. And so if your child isn't, you know, improving in digital literacy skills through their like primary education trajectory, that needs to happen somewhere else like I think we've all experienced here the quote-unquote like old school approaches to things and they're just not applicable in the same way anymore um and so like as a parent that can be as simple as ask your kid what the funny thing they saw on TikTok recently like show me that TikTok um and then have a conversation about it it doesn't have to be some huge big undertaking it's just opening up those conversations and if you're not comfortable having those conversations or your kid isn't comfortable talking to you about anything I'm thinking about like my teenage nephews there um just make sure that they've got people in their lives whether it's an educator a friend an aunt an uncle someone who they can have those conversations with yeah, no, fantastic. I think that's, you know, a great advice there. As you say, just have those conversations, have that dialogue and making sure that your child has somebody that they can trust to do so. So, yeah, thank you, Dalton. I think that's invaluable. Um, do, um, Dr. Laurie and Elise, is anything that you guys wanted to, to contribute as well? Any final thoughts? Yeah, so I'll just add seeing that I deal with those in the primary age is just, you know, as a parent, start to introduce them and it's all about test and learns, right? Not every child will feel comfortable with every medium right away, but try them with a digital book, right? To start off, perhaps if they're more into video, there is a video opportunity and keep it educational, but mix in the balance of it all. So playing an online French game in our world when our students are given screen time is what we recommend. It's okay to play an online French game, uh, it's okay to read an online book or even on the iPad or however you want to access it. So yeah, I would just say test and learn. Know that every digital method isn't going to be for every child, but it is important as Dalton shared. As a parent, you should explore it with them. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. As you say, not, not just thinking, well, this didn't work and just rejecting it because then you're shutting yourself off to a plethora of um, platforms and apps and all sorts so why deny that and as a parent as well you get that enjoyment of going through it and exploring that with them which is incredible so yeah thank you Elise and Dr Laurie any final comments from yourself just like Elise said it's really important to just get started and Elise and Dalton both said it's important to just get started with this but I also think moderation is, is Important to keep in mind too, like just because it's really important to start with digital literacy and with uh, being exposed to digital 
items and digital aspects of technology, that doesn't mean it needs to be an all day thing either. So it's, it's important to keep screen time in mind as well, you know, introduce it, but depending on their age, make sure it's not just this the only the only thing they're doing it's not the only way they're getting information and that's not the only thing they're engaging with so uh, a healthy amount but a little bit of non-digital aspects are also important so i you know everything in moderation is important to keep in mind no thank you uh, dr i think that's a, you know a key you know a key point as well just as you say everything in moderation right just the same way if your kid had their nose in a book 24 seven while they need to, to be able to eat. You want them to be able to interact and socialize with others. Same with the screen time, right? So just having that healthy balance. Um, but thank you. I wanted to say thank you to all our expert panelists for being here this evening or this morning for some of you guys as well. Really appreciate your insights. Um, I will let you know if there's any comments as well. Uh, keep them coming guys, comment there, send your emails and I will make sure that Dalton, Elise and Dr. Laurie get them so that they can answer them. But thank you all again. Um, Thank you everyone for watching as well on Facebook. Um, have a fantastic evening. Enjoy the rest of your week and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Bye.